Thanks very much for uh, coming along this morning. Hope you enjoyed last night's dinner and uh, you've saved a little bit for this evening's uh, grand bash. Um, I was just reflecting on Christine's uh, talk last night and I was thinking about uh, Mosaic. I don't know if you remember that. It was the first browser that sort of came out in 93, a graphical browser, and I was sort of looking at that and thinking, oh, this is so slow. You know, why wouldn't you use FTP? It'll never take off. You know? So yeah, don't look to me for futuristic uh, advice. Anyway, um, I'd like to introduce our uh, first speaker of the morning. Um, I met Stephen about 20 years ago when he... He came to the company I worked for uh, to introduce us to good project management. We were soon making Lego bridges, totally focused in the task at hand and making all the classic mistakes like not listening to the user's needs or the real needs of the customers. And it was a highly informative and entertaining two days and I still carry some of those lessons with me today. Stephen's rated as one of the top three lecturers in uh, one of Europe's top MBA schools. He's uh, reputation for making complex management concepts such as project and change management and being able to distill that down into highly informative and fun lectures um, often using storytelling techniques. Um, he's covered topics as varied as the Challenger and Columbia shuttle disasters and to how Harold could have managed the project, uh, the Battle of Hastings a bit better and maybe would have won. Unusually for an academic he's also spent his uh, uh, working life in real business and still runs his own highly successful project management company. Um, his attitude is if you haven't done it, you shouldn't be teaching it. Um, Stephen's going to um, look at how complex change is managed in uh, organizations, um, and I'd like to invite Stephen Carver up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, John. Right, good morning ladies and gentlemen, it's lovely to be here and now I've got to live up to the billing. So um, I'm going to give you a number which is 68%. Uh, 68% uh, apparently according to the experts uh, is the project failure rate this year globally. Uh, if you're into IT projects it's more like about 95%. Now try and think, and this is according to PwC and the Standish Group and the PMI, the so-called experts, uh, and every year they do this survey, and it's always around the late 60s. Now we could have a huge debate about what they really mean about project success or project failure. They tend to be somewhat uh, 70s about the whole thing. What was the original budget? What did you spend? What was the original time scale? How long did it take? What did you say you were going to deliver? What did you actually deliver? If any of those are out, it's a failure. Now it's funny because I've worked on projects that were on time, on budget and to specification which were complete fiascos uh, and I've worked on projects that were hideously over budget, hideously late and never delivered what they originally promised yet they were phenomenal successes. So I would argue straight away with this figure of 68% or 95% if you're in IT. Um, now you'll get to hear from Ron the reasons why projects go wrong. Can you guess why? What do you think is the biggest reason why projects go, uh, don't work? Why change fails? Requirements. Requirements not being understood. Good answer, very technical. Be even more basic. John alluded to it. What don't human beings do? Listen. Listen. And the trouble with change is that it stresses people because nobody wants change. And I'll let that one settle for a while as well. Uh, if you are a change manager, you are Mr. or Mrs. Unpopular. Everyone wants the benefits of the change, but they don't want the change itself. And the person actually instigating that change is an enemy of the people immediately, uh, as Machiavelli once pointed out. Now, when I talk to my MBAs, I say there are four generic uh, ways of thinking about change, or four change types. Uh, there's change you want to do uh, and should be planned. These are called strategic projects. And uh, the book on how to run those is, is fairly obvious. You get the PIM book, you get the APM book of knowledge, or if you print two, my goodness me. How many of you have done a print two course? Excellent. How many of you enjoyed it? <laughs> uh, quite. And, oh, what or two of you? Oh dear, I'll speak to you later. Um, but certainly the, these books of knowledge or these methodologies uh, are always punted as this is the answer. And it's not, I'm afraid. Uh, they have their uses, but it's about... Uh, it's like getting excited about spanners. So, well, it is, let's be honest. So, 
change that you want to do and should be planned, strategic projects, they are covered by all of those good things. And quite honestly, if those type of projects fail, you really have to go back to school because those projects, somebody wants them to happen. Someone will make a budget available, someone will bang on a table and say, make this so, and I want to see a plan. And so therefore, will be measured against it. Those type of projects are called um, the red projects. The blue projects are far more difficult. Some of you might be involved in them. These are projects which have to be planned because they involve a lot of money and a lot of hassle, a lot of people, um, but actually nobody really wants them. Now, I work a lot with the banks at the moment and they do stacks of these. They're called compliance projects. And have you ever tried bouncing into someone's office and say, hi there, would you like to join me on this compliance project? Uh, what's the normal response? Yeah, sharp knives or bricks are thrown at you. No one wants to get involved in these. Uh, and so when I actually judge project managers, I don't know how many um, red type projects they do. They're easy. It's the blue type projects. How many projects have you managed where the stakeholders, quite honestly, wanted you dead? And yet you still manage to deliver because then you understand stakeholder engagement as opposed to use or abuse of steering committees, which are the red ones. Then, of course, you have the projects which are unplanned and nobody wants to do, apparently. We call them crisis events. And the dirty little secret is that most people in most organisations love having a good crisis. Because it means they can throw away the plan, they can throw away the work breakdown structure, the network analysis, grab a mobile phone, preferably two mobile phones, and if you're a male, you can then walk up and down corridors attached to these mobile phones, shouting at people. Uh, and you can say, we have a crisis, and you can disrupt people's lives, and they can all come in for a good old crisis meeting. It achieves nothing, but it's huge fun. And if, <laughs> if you can do it on somebody else's budget uh, in a no-blame culture, why not? Now, I'm pretty good at uh, crisis management. In fact, I'm teaching it tomorrow at the university. Um, I don't particularly enjoy it, but I happen to be good at it. It's one of those things that I've just got a talent for. And I teach it because I have to do it a lot. When I go into my clients and their projects are out of control and everyone's strutting around with mobile phones, uh, they've got a crisis. The first thing I have to do is just sort that mess out, calm them down. And once they're calmed down and we've extracted the mobile phones and their hot little fingers, then we can start to push them back into either the red box or the blue box. Does this make sense to you? The whole point of doing this and actually getting control is so you can move into the final box. I call it the yellow box. Uh, and this is unplanned, but you want to do it. I call it serendipity. Some people call it having time to think strategically. This is when you actually have time in your office to close the door, if that's what you want to do, and just think. Or perhaps have time to go and meet someone that you wouldn't normally meet. By the way, well done to all of you. You've done about a bit of that over the last two days. I'm sure your emails are piling up. I'm sure there's crises back at your organisations. But you've chosen to come here and actually hear different speakers talking about different things, and most importantly, over dinner or coffee, talking to people who have similar issues. And that's where you have time to think strategically. Agreed? Okay. So the number one reason why projects go wrong is breakdown of communication because of stress, because nobody wants the change. Second reason why projects go wrong, apparently, is a lack of planning. Um, I you always use a quote from Sir John Harvey Jones. Do you remember him? Troubleshooter, BBC, used to run ICI. Um, people don't like to plan, he says. Planning is unnatural. It's far more fun just to do. And the nice thing about just doing is that failure comes as a complete surprise. <laughs> Whereas if you have planned, the failure is preceded by a long period of despair and worry. <laughs> Welcome to our world. It's one of despair and worry. I used to build oil platforms in the North Sea. I was a warrior, a North Sea tiger. I'm no longer a warrior. I'm a warrior. That's my job. When I have to try and get boards of directors' uh, attitudes changed about projects and change, um, I actually use an analogy, and please feel free to use it as well. Uh, many people quote me on it. Um, I say projects uh, are a bit like aeroplane flights. Now, I'd like you to think about the last time you flew. Um, you voluntarily got yourselves into a thin metal tube uh, called, let's say, an A320 if you're flying around the UK or Europe. Okay. Now, I work with Airbus, so I can tell you all about this. So you get yourselves into a thin metal tube, probably with most of your organisation's economy as well, but there you go. Um, and would you like to see the crash resistance of an A320 airframe? 
it hasn't got any crash resistance. It hasn't even got the structural integrity of a Coca-Cola can. So, anyway, I don't want to worry you. So you get yourselves into this thin metal tube. Uh, you're given no safety equipment, of course. And you're thinking, yes, I am. What? What safety equipment are you given? Are you given an ejector seat? Are you given a parachute? No. And some of you are thinking, oh, no, 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 I've got, I've got a safety belt. No, you have not. You have a lap belt. And that has one purpose, according to Airbus and all the other manufacturers, which is to keep your body in your prescribed seat so identification of the corpse is easier. Uh, the only people that get safety... Oh, I'm sorry to worry you. Okay. <laughs> the only people that get proper safety belts are pilot, co-pilot, and you look, the entire crew. They get a four-point inertia and a proper crash seat. You don't get anything. You get a lap belt. Okay. Oh, and by the way, so yes, you do get a plastic life jacket and a whistle for attracting attention. <laughs> So there you are, uh, in this thin metal tube. Now, by the way, at this point, why are you in this thin metal tube? Do you really want to be in this? Uh, no, you don't. What you want to be is at your destination. And you see, that's the thing about projects. They're like flights. They take you from where you are to where you want to be. There's my strategic vision for the university in two years' time. Well, how nice. That's two years in the future. You're not there now, you're here. How the hell are you going to get there? Now, I used to be head of strategy for Halliburton. I, strategy is hard, but wow, implementation of strategy is a lot harder because it's the journey, and that's what we do. We are change managers and project managers. We are pilots of planes. Last time I flew, I was out in Moscow. I had to come back to London, um, and I certainly wanted to get back to London. Um, I, if I could have clicked my fingers and just been back at home, that's what I wanted. But instead, I had to get into this thin metal Aeroflot tube uh, and uh, get ready at the end of the runway. So again, just taking the analogy a little bit further, the pilot at the front, otherwise known as the project manager to me, the person that manages the change of where you are to where you want to be, fills up the wings full of 22,000 litres of high-explosive fuel called Jet A-Wen. Again, I don't want to worry you too much. Now, uh, on a, a tricycle, on a tricycle, think of this, it's only got the three wheels, uh, you are then uh, sent down the runway, uh, 70, 80, 90, 100 miles an hour, 120 miles an hour, 140 miles an hour, so about 160 miles an hour. Think about the speed of your car as you drive home. Uh, at the end of the runway, the lunatic pulls back on a little stick and launches you into the air. You are now a flying bomb. Uh, he or she will now accelerate you up to 580 miles an hour. They will take you up to 35,000 feet above the surface of planet Earth, where the air is so thin and so cold, if you tried to actually breathe it, uh, you would die. Now, if you fully understand the situation, you're now in your second bottle of Jack Daniels. Now, uh, uh, coming back from Russia, I looked out the window, I thought, oh, I don't like this. We were flying across the Baltic. I hate flying over water. Why? Because there's nowhere to land. And if you try and land, you're going to die. Uh, okay, uh, and then the lunatic that flew you then threw you back at, at another piece of concrete, de-accelerated you from 580 miles an hour uh, down to zero, lined you up exactly with the air bridge, you got off, and uh, the flight I got off on the other day, um, the pilot was there, you know, uh, thank you ladies and gentlemen, and the bloke uh, in front of me said, we're four minutes late, and just walked down the air bridge, and I thought, that's what it's like as a project manager. <laughs> So are you okay with this analogy of flight? So, once you've got this analogy of project managers being a bit like pilots, a thankless task, you take people from where they are to where they want to be, and if you do it well, you make it look easy. And everyone takes you for granted, such is life. Because people don't want exciting flights, do they? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. Now, um, uh, people tell me that this A380 cannot fly upside down. This morning and on this flight, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. Uh, no, you don't want that sort of pilot. You want a nice, boring, dull, calm pilot. I happened to pick up the Financial Times this morning, and funnily enough, they're using the same analogy. Listen to this. Captain Hammond calmly navigates the air pockets, it says here. If you ever had the misfortune to be caught up in an in-flight emergency, you'd certainly want Philip Hammond flying the plane. I don't mean that he would fly particularly well, but the delivery of the autumn statement suggests he would be rather soothing, uh, soothing in his voice on the tannoy. 
Uh, here was the Chancellor of the Exchequer announcing that Britain was flying into the economic equivalent of a Force 11 storm with little more inflection than if he was telling passengers that biscuits had run out in economy class. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Because we do like our pilots and our project managers to stay calm at all times. And that is your number one job because everybody else is going to be stressed and because they're stressed they become stupid and because they're stu stupid they don't listen and they don't communicate and the project goes wrong, number one reason. So, number one, pilots should be calm. Number two, they should be qualified. Ooh. I am stunned by the number of people who are given the title project manager and they have absolutely no help, no support, no qualifications, no nothing. Can you imagine it in real life? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. <laughs> well, 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 when I say captain, uh, normally I run the Costa Coffee Bar here at T5. <laughs> um, we're a bit short on business today. Uh, they're short of a captain. I've always fancied having a crack at this. Uh, I, I've read the manual, um, you know, how to fly an A380, otherwise known as Prince 2. How hard can this be? Uh, houses get bigger, houses get smaller, left, right, let's go. You'd think you're insane, mate. But that's what happens on most projects. Agreed? I'm amazed by how little real project training these people have. Now, the one thing that bothers pilots above all other things, and we've just alluded to it, is something they can't control, which is weather. Now, we are going through turbulence at the moment economically. Your projects will go through turbulence. Brexit has changed everything. I look after the Cabinet Office. I was there the morning that Brexit was announced, and I've never seen so many headless chickens in my life. And my job was to calm them all down. The world was not going to come to an end. It was just more change on top of change. Get on with it. It's weather. So, pilots like project managers worry about political economic weather. We have to. Uh, one of the first questions I've ever asked project managers is, what's the weather like on your project? And if they look out the window and start saying oh, it's blue sky, I, I wonder about their ability to actually manage the project because they should have picked up the fact that it's the airspace, the politics and the social systems that you're flying through. Unless you're completely connected with them, you are going to fly into turbulence without even knowing it. Does this make sense to you? What do pilots love doing before the actual flight? Checklists. Now, if I may, uh, I'll grab a chair here. Nothing terrible is going to happen yet. Okay, so um, now I need someone else. Would you like to come up, uh, sir, bring your chair? So I, uh, your name is? Paul. Paul, bring your chair, Paul. That's cool. Okay, so Paul and I are about to take off in an A320. Okay, so Paul, let's sit you down. Okay. Right. Okay. Good morning, Paul. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Paul. How are you? Fine, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm in the left-hand seat, Paul, and that makes me the captain. Okay? And we're all equal on the flight deck, but some of us are more equal than others. Okay? Excellent. Excellent. So, um, right, I think we're going to take this A320 to Brussels this morning. Now, I know we're running almost half an hour late, and the... Uh, self-loading freight are getting quite fraught at the back. Uh, but I thought we'd now do our checklist. Do you want for a good checklist? Oh, yes. Excellent. I do enjoy a good checklist. Now, it says here that the A320 has two wings. One should be on the left-hand side. <laughs> one should be on the right-hand side. If two are on one side, go back to checklist item number 123. Okay, I think I can do this. Are you ready to check yours? Oh, yes. You've got one? I have one. Excellent. This is going well. <laughs> Tick. It says here the A320 has two engines. One should be located on the left-hand left wing and one should be located on the right-hand wing. Go for this one. I've got one. One. This is, this is making my day, isn't it, you? Fabulous. And you're thinking, oh, come on, Biggles, let's take off. Why don't we just give all this to the ground crew? And they could. They could give it all to the ground crew. You could save 15 minutes on every single commercial flight, and you could probably negate having to have a third airport uh, runway at Heathrow. But I can assure you, even if we negated all this, and we had standards and methodologies and compliance and, and signatures, I can assure you that the captain and the co-pilot would check it all again. Why? Then nicely put, they don't want to die, the gentleman said here. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Superb input there, thank you. Right to the point, I'd have you on my project. Okay. 
As one captain said to me, he said, I check everything regardless uh, because I arrive at the scene of the air accident first and at speed. <laughs> and that the ground crew, who should have checked but didn't because they had a bit of a row with their girlfriend that morning and they felt a bit stressed and they missed out a couple of items on the checklist, will read about my death over coffee and donuts the next day. And you think, ooh, get you, Mr. Control Freak. And then I thought, yeah, I'm like that. Because you see, on the ground, we still have choices. Agreed? When you're in the air, you haven't got any choices. And there's only one way you're going to go, which is down. And so that's why project managers, if they're good, do a lot of checking before the damn thing takes off. We can't cover for everything, but we'd sooner have options on the ground. And one of the greatest options is don't take off. Don't fly. This one is not going to fly. We haven't got enough fuel. We haven't got enough cash. We haven't got support. We're going through a hurricane. This is ridiculous. It's a kamikaze, and I'm not flying it. By the way, they will always find somebody to fly it. Uh, but yes? <laughs> Because there are people out there who think, oh, how hard can this be? You know, I've done Prince 2 course. And you think, off you go then. Have a nice day. I'll give you the little thing. Excellent. So thank you very much indeed for flying me, Peter. Superb. Take your chair back. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely. So project managers are like pilots. Uh, and they do all the things that pilots do. Now, what I'd like to do now is to move on a little bit to um, complexity. Because... The big thing at the moment is I go to my clients and they say, oh, we can't manage projects, it's all too complex, it's all too complex. Well, first of all, I say, well, what do you mean by complex? Well, everything's changing at the same time, and the sponsors have changed, and the budgets have changed, and now Brexit, panic, panic, panic. So we just calm them down. Most of the time, I'm afraid, their projects are not complex. They are merely complicated. There's lots to do. It's all interconnected. But if you do a little bit of stakeholder analysis and you actually start to work out having calmed down what needs to be done, it's a complicated, and, and just like a watch mechanism, once you understand it, you can predict how it's going to behave. So calming them down and pushing them into the complicated box is step number one. Complex, yeah, they do exist, and we've done a lot of research on it at Cranfield, because this is the big thing, complexity. So, complexity. Complexity is a non-linear system. Uh, a watch, uh, you can predict. It's a complicated system, but you can predict exactly what's going to happen. It's gone forward by a second. It's just done it again. It's just done it again. It's just done it again. I could do this all morning. Uh, you'd get extremely bored. If it turned into a banana, I would be extremely surprised. It is a watch, and it just does what watches do. Complex is non-linear. You can't predict. And so the mindset of a project manager, and I'm a professional project manager, but traditionally trained, I used to be loyal platforms, they were complicated. They weren't really complex, they were complicated. Uh, and so you had your waterfalls and you had your WBS and your critical path or you know, critical chain, and you did all the calculations and it was click, click, click. And it appeals to engineers. And by the way, it also appeals to IT people. Agreed? because IT people are trained the same way as engineers. You know, it's binary. The right answer is, I've got a model that does this. And quite right too, that's what you need to be a professional IT person or professional engineer. But hey, once you're moving to projects, you're talking about social systems, and they are not linear. They are not logical. Agreed? Stakeholders change their minds. People get stressed and say different things at the steering committee meeting that they said last week. Such is life. Complexity. Now, I sat down with a very clever guy called Dr. Harvey Mailer, who's an expert in complexity, and I said, Harvey, how many types of complexity are there according to the academics? And he said, oh, 42, which I thought was quite good. Um, and I said, right, uh, that's not useful to practitioners. Uh, if I said to you, right, I'm now going to take you through 42 different types of complexity that you have to manage on your project, and you'd say, uh, get out of here, I've got, I've got so much to do. So I said to Harvey, can you reduce it down to three? Now, it sounds easy, it's actually incredibly difficult. He actually managed to publish a paper on it. So anyone in the university system will know to actually get a published paper means that all of the other academics could not drag him down. Uh, some of you might not know this, um, but the academic community is not uh, supportive and friendly. It's just a whole bunch of um, bullies. Uh, basically, if you come up with an idea, they immediately try and kick it down. Uh, and if you survive and they can't knock you down, then you get a paper out of it and they all go, damn, damn, damn. Uh, and the revenge will be sweet. 
So the good thing about that system is that you can't publish rubbish you know, because everybody would say it's rubbish. So he managed to get a paper out of this which I thought was phenomenal. And the usual stuff, you know, it's not exact and it's a practitioner model, la la la. But I rather liked it and I've used it in many companies since. So I'm just going to give it to you now. I can give you the reference afterwards of the academic paper if you like. And books are being written about it now. He said, right, we're going to have three types of complexity. We're going to try and push the 42 into what he called three buckets. And I rather like that expression, bucket, uh, because it kind of gave an idea. It, it is slightly crude, it's a practitioner model. So, the blue bucket. The blue bucket is what he called structural complexity. That's the number of bits of people, uh, work breakdown structure, um, subcontractors, the number of bits that you had to manage on the project. So something like a, an oil platform will be a high structural uh, project. It's got a lot of, of, of bits to it. Does that make sense? Most of that's dealt with on um, um, uh, traditional project management. Not too much of an issue there. Next one is emergent, what we call the green now, this bucket was really where I'm at at the moment, which is, hey, we fix the scope, but as soon as we fix it, it changes. Now, a traditional project manager will say, excuse me, change, 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 stop everything. Right, here's the change control form. Everyone has to sign it off. Senior responsible officer, steering committee have to approve it, uh, and then we'll have to re-baseline the project, and then off we go. That was the way it was traditionally done, and in some projects, should still be done that way. But what happens when you've got a project, by the time you've filled out the form, I'm afraid six more changes have arrived, and, and you can't even keep up with the bureaucracy, let alone the actual change. So we call these emergent complexities. So uh, evolving scope, unknown unknowns or uh, unknown knowns. Things that are going to appear, whether you like it or not, and largely can't control them. How do you deal with those? The third bucket was the real messy bucket. A lot went into this bucket. Uh, we called it the red bucket. We called it the socio-political bucket. This was social systems, stakeholders, politics, backstabbing, use and abuse of power social systems. Does this kind of make sense? And what we found was that um, the first thing we did actually was once we got this model, we actually got 248, it's all in the academic paper, qualified project managers, qualified project managers with at least 20 years experience. So these people were not just this, they'd actually done it, got the t-shirt. And they were in a technology environment by the way, it was HP. So we got these 248 uh, project managers and we said, right, in your projects over your career and now, of the three types of complexity, which one gives you most grief? Structural, emergent, or socio-political? And what do you think the answer was? Socio-political. 80% of respondents said that was their number one problem on their projects. Socio-political. And so we, that, that's good, it all tied into the research, that's what we thought. It was nice to have it actually laid out academically as opposed to just someone's hot air and opinion. We then asked them a second question and the groan from the room was incredible. We said to the people, thank you very much indeed for that, in your own formal training and development, which of the three complexities has received the most attention? And the answer was structural. 80% of their problems came from socio-political, 80% of their training was on structural, how to use PRINCE2. It's what we call a killer slide. When you put it up in front of boards of directors, they will go, oh, and you say, that's why your projects are failing. You're training your people up in the wrong way to do the wrong things at the wrong time. Ouch. A little word about agile. Um, I am sick to death of hearing the word agile, okay? <laughs> I go to lots of companies and the board, and by the way, often the board have absolutely no idea about change management. Again, they've, got, they've dreamt of a strategy over gin and tonic, how nice for them. But they've never managed a project or a change project in their lives and they just dump it over to the fence. Oh, I've got a brilliant strategy, you know, make that happen. Really? And so often the board have no conception about change management. They are very ignorant of it. But when I go in and talk to boards, they all say, I've heard about project management, the latest thing is agile. And I say, oh dear, um, <laughs> agile. And it's like, I'm a dude, I'm agile. Uh, and I always say, do you understand what agile is? Oh, it's much faster and cheaper and better. I say, no, it is not. Typically agile is going to cost you 30% more they go, Ooh, really? Yes. Look at the stats. Uh, the chances of success, uh, actually, however you want to define them, go down. But the advantage is you will have some product earlier than you would have had with Waterfall. And they go, ooh, that's not what we expected. I even had one buffoon the other day. He said, we haven't just got Agile, we've got Lean Agile. And he, I just wanted to smack him. I said, yeah. <laughs> What type of methodology are you using? He said, oh, we don't do methodologies, we're agile. I said, look, is it a turn, is it scrum, we've got scrum masters. No, we're just agile, but lean. 
Oh, have you come across these people? He just puts... <laughs> Idiot. Now, the analogy, by the way, for an agile project manager, and it works quite well, is fighter pilot. Now, initially, people think, oh, yeah, that's me. I'm a fighter pilot, top gun. I can just see myself. No, no, no. I spend a lot of time with the RAF, um, actually doing a lot of work with them. I interview um, and have been up in a fast jet with um, these, these guys. They are not like the movies. They are the most boring individuals you can <laughs> ever imagine. Put them near a fast jet and you go, oh, wow, how fast does it go? Uh, well, it goes at um, Mark II, uh, but that depends, obviously, on the altitude, the relative humidity, and you're thinking, oh, tell me it's exciting. And they are really dull people. You should see them going through their checklists. The thing that got me at Coningsby was the toilets. You walk into the gents and all of the walls are covered with checklists and it's not a joke. And so you're standing there in the urinal and there's this checklist of how to actually power up the gas turbines. Uh, you go in uh, to the cubicles on the on the back of the door are all the weapons checklists, and it's not there as a joke. They all sit there. <laughs> really dull people. Uh, they are hugely trained. They have deep respect for them, but they are the ultimate nerds, uh, and that's what agile project managers are. They're not dudes. They are the most highly trained project managers that you have, and what you give fighter pilots, unlike commercial airline pilots, is, apart from weapons, what else do you give them? Freedom. They can make their own decisions because they have to make them fast. They've got a ground-to-air missile coming out. They can't say, oh, ground-to-air missile. Let me have a little look in my risk register. Now, um, <laughs> okay. It's not there. Oh, dear. So, um, <laughs> let me pick up my methodology. What to do a risk occurs that is not in your risk register. You will contact your senior responsible officer. Let me, okay, right. Yeah. Hello, Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got an incoming uh, ground-to-air missile here. Yeah, coming in about four times the speed of sound. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. We missed on the risk register. I know, I know, I know. So I'm just contacting you. So the next steps. That's right. Yeah, I, I thought the methodology. So we, we now need to have a steering committee meeting. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. And uh, Yeah, Jim has to be there, obviously. Yeah. Oh, he's on holiday. Oh, where's he gone? Oh, I beat her. That's nice. Nice this time of year. Okay, so it'll be what? Wednesday after next? Yeah? Okay. I won't be there. <laughs> and so, when I talk to boards of directors, I say, you've got to empower these people to make the decisions. And then they back off again and say, so it's more expensive and I have to empower these people to make decisions without coming to us. Damn right. I don't want Agile. I'm not knocking Agile. I like Agile. But it's, again, situational upon the actual project. Is this okay so far? Lovely. What I'd like to do as a final uh, bit uh, uh, for this morning is to play a little game to pull all of this together. Uh, it's a very simple game. Here we go. Thank you, sir. You have the ball. Would you like to throw it to someone over here, please? Oh, my goodness me. A bit of a deflection has come back to you. That often happens on projects. Straight on my head, on my head, son. Would you like to pick it up? Uh, madam, have you got it? Chuck it over to here, please. Excellent. Oh, dear. Oh, well done, sir. Over here, I think. Oh, gosh. Oh, yes. Well done, sir. Chuck it over here. Well done, sir. Throw it to the back. Oh, sorry, the madam. Yes, you could have it. Throw it over, over there, please, sir. Oh, gosh. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Uh, throw it over there, please, sir. <laughs> Who's got that? And throw it slightly backwards, I think. They need to have a go. Oh, dear, sir. Yeah, I think that's yours. Throw it forward now, if you wouldn't mind. It's down there somewhere. Madam, could you throw it back to me on stage? That'd be lovely. Have you got it down there? Lovely. Oh, oh gosh. Oh, well, I'll grab that one. It's okay. I'll grab that one. Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful. Okay. That was pathetic. Um, <laughs> that was 36 seconds. Useless. That was a change project going around an organization. I was the CEO. Why did it take you so damn long? Certainly you weren't prepared. Was I a good CEO? No, I come up, we all have got a strategy. Well, how nice for me. Okay? And I just threw it into the organisation, expecting them all to deal with it. Well, why the hell should they be able to deal with it? They've got day jobs to do. They're already stressed. They're doing their emails. And suddenly this damn strategy hits them. And it's like, what the hell was that? So you need to prepare people before you actually throw change at them. Otherwise, it stresses them even more. 
What else happened? Well, sometimes people just couldn't catch it. Okay, and by the way, it's funny, sometimes I video this, I divide the audience into two, we show the video clips. Some people going, hmm, 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 and some people going, hmm, hmm, hmm. And this happens in organisations. And by the way, quite right sometimes to do, I'm not going to get involved with this stupid game. Uh, other times, yes, please, I want to get involved in change. So there will be different attitudes with your new stakeholders as to how much they want to get engaged with this silly game. Um, it did happen three times, by the way, it just fell down and lay there. And again, it's fascinating. Everyone just looks at it and thinks, <laughs> not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> and that happens in real organisations, yes. The change hits something and people say, well, it's not my department, it's not my, I, I had nothing to do with it, you didn't have it. Well, at some point, somebody's going, oh, for goodness sake, pick it up. And so you pick it up and you carry on with the game. So it took you 36 seconds, which is useless. So I want you to prove on this conference that you're better at the last, than the last conference I did, because they did it in a lot less, 10 seconds. Now, um, I would like the same people to do it in the same order. That's the only compliance and governance I'm going to give you. Every time I bounce this ball, I'm afraid 1% of your funding is going to go, because the government have decided, and they have, by the way, unless you can change, they're just going to take money away from you and give it to people who are willing to change. So a little bit of pressure for you there. One. Two. Your funding's going down. Three. Four. <laughs> oh, hello, this looks good. Oh, oh, oh right, okay. <laughs> Right, hold it, hold it there, sir, hold it. Even if I ha give it to you, and I'm well done for what you've just done, who, goes, who does it go to next? I'm going to ask who's next. Right, well, come on then, you do that. I'll hold it whilst Two you do seconds. that. Come on. Put your hands up if you're involved in the game. Right, do whatever you need to do. I'll, I'll hold the clock. Sir, you came in, yes, and over there. Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, sir. That's wonderful. Right, hold it there for a second. Let's just take apart what happened there. So I threw in a change. We all had a bit of a laugh. It took too long. And I said, it has to be done in less. Uh, and uh, everyone said, yes, ha, ha. And then I applied external pressure, funding. And suddenly, the whole room went cold on me. <laughs> Because you see, unfortunately, you do sometimes have to force change because most people don't want to change. They're quite happy sitting in their <coughs> chairs. They expect to come to a nice little lecture with some PowerPoint slides uh, and then suddenly they're involved in it and they think, hang on a minute, yeah, I, I like the thought of that, but I don't want to get personally involved. So, quite incredible. We had a natural leader. Where is he? A natural leader came barreling up towards me. It was wonderful, full of adrenaline. He wanted to take ownership of the project. Well done you. I'd have you on my team. Um, at that point, nobody else wanted to be counted. It was like, I didn't catch the ball. And people were going, yes, you did. It was you, wasn't it? And most of it is quite interesting to see because the people were saying, get out there, get out there, were the people who did not catch the ball. Uh, and you see, it's so easy when you're not involved in a project. Oh, yes, you should be involved in that project. Ah, so off you go. Piece of cake. Prince too. You'll be fine. Okay. So, well done to all of you. you you've left the security because you thought you could be happy sitting on your seats for the next hour and a half and suddenly some lunatic is, is putting you under pressure and you don't like it and you don't want it. This is how people feel. But well done, you've done it. Okay, a little bit of peer pressure, but there you go. And your funding only went down by 4%, not bad. Okay, so will you give me an estimate, team, how quickly you can do this? Ten seconds. Ten seconds. <laughs> You're buying into that. It has to be the same people in the same order. Okay. By the way, did you notice it took them longer to actually work out what they did than it did to actually do it in the first place? Uh, but that's planning for you. There's also an element of risk management there as well. And if you've got a photographic memory, you don't have to go tell whether they're telling the truth or not. Absolutely. So projects are based upon trust. What a fascinating thought. And it's a good point. Largely they are. Ouch. Because it's not operational. Operational, you can have audits and all the rest of it. Projects, you can do audits, but lots of stuff gets lost. Agreed? So again, compliance, auditing, it's very difficult. Um, regulatory uh, framework around projects, that's hard, really hard. So, 10 seconds team, yes? You ready? You don't look too happy about this project. Okay, are you ready? <coughs> Three, two, one, go. One, two, three, four, five, 
Six. Six seconds. Well done. Now, as, as, as Vice-Chancellor of the University, I say, excuse me, but we allocated ten. Uh, you asked for ten, and you only spent six. Why did you ask for ten in the first place? I hope you weren't increasing your budget and cross-charging it into other things. Have you ever heard of this? People cross-charge between projects. I'm sure you've never done it. Excellent. Um, well, that was a very good team. And notice they went for what we call the linear approach, uh, a waterfall, effectively. Um, I want you to do it in less, a lot less. I reckon you can do this in two seconds. Five. Excellent. So we've now gone from a waterfall, linear, uh, actually to a more sort of scrum type environment. Okay. Notice the one person they're missing out from the whole process is... <laughs> they're all pointing their fingers. Oh, I'm not getting happy faces back. <laughs> and that happens as well. Because these good people are under stress, they quickly see the client or the key stakeholder as what? The enemy. It's a psychological thing that happens on projects. I, I've just come back from teaching BAE. They have terrible problems with this. And because they're in defence, it gets even more literally defensive. But, you know, they, they start to see the, the client as the enemy, as the problem. But, of course, you know, the enemy is not the, the client. The enemy is the challenge. But people very quickly go into this mindset. So are you going to accept me into your team? Oh, thank you so much. Well, what would you, what would you like me to do? Just hand you the ball. How, how many seconds? Sorry. Two seconds. Now, it's interesting to see the faces there. It was like, <laughs> shit. <Okay. laughs> the leader, the natural leader, has committed to this. Okay. Oh, look at this. Okay. Three, two, one. One, two, three. Not bad. I reckon they could do it even better. What should they really do with me? Where should I be? In the, now, look at the body language. Three fingers in the middle. <laughs> now, I love that. When, as a senior, you know, Often in the company, people start pointing their fingers at me and saying, you do that, I feel great. Because it means that my team feel empowered. And that's what I want. If I have to tell them everything they have to do, then I'll become their father. I don't want that. I want them to tell me what to do. I want you, Pro Vice Chancellor, to allocate that fund there and that fund there and put that person there. When that happens, I can assure you, senior people are happy about this, or the good ones are. Okay, so I will go, and I will go into the normal position that all senior people have to go to at the uh, project meetings, which is on their knees, <laughs> hoping to God the team can pull this off, otherwise my bonus is on the line. Okay, right, and I'm going to get involved, get those fingers in. Excuse me, compliance, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me, get those fingers in, I want them touched in order. Are you ready for this? Three, two, one, go! One second, well done team. <laughs> Round of applause, thank you very much indeed, thank you. And thank you sir, well done. Now, if I told you you could do that in one second initially, would you believe me? No, but it can be done. And it's all about communication and people coming out of their normal ways of operating and physically, perhaps, and mentally going into new spaces. And it can be done. And you've got to get the client at the middle of it. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.